Chapter 9 Nitya Dharma Material Science and Civilization Lahiri Mahashai lived in the association of Vaishnavas in Sri Godruma for three or four years, and thus his heart became fully pure. At all times he chanted Harinam, while eating, walking and sitting, before sleeping and after rising. He wore simple clothes and did not even use shoes or sandals. He had relinquished his pride in his caste so completely that as soon as he saw a Vaishnava, he would offer him Dandavat Pranam and forcibly take the dust from his feet. He would seek out pure Vaishnavas in order to honor the remnants of their meals. His sons came to him from time to time, but when they understood his mood, they departed quickly, not daring to propose that he should come home with them. To look at Lahiri Mahashai now, one would certainly take him to be a Vaishnava Babaji. From the philosophy of the Vaishnavas of Sri Godruma, Lahiri Mahashai had understood that the essential principle is genuine detachment within the heart, and not the adoption of the external dress of renunciation. In order to minimize his needs, he followed the example of Sri Sanatan Goswami and tore one piece of cloth into four to use as his garments. Nonetheless, he still wore his sacred thread around his neck. Whenever his sons wanted to give him some money, he would reply, I will not accept even a single kodi from materialists. Chandrasekhar, his eldest son, once brought him a hundred rupees for a festival to feed the Vaishnavas, but Lahiri Mahashai remembered Sri Das Goswami's example and did not accept the money. One day, Paramahamsa Babaji said, Lahiri Mahashai, you are now free from all traces of non-Vaishnava behavior. Even though we have accepted the vows of mendicancy, we can still learn much from you about renunciation. If only you had a Vaishnava name, everything would be completely perfect. Lahiri Mahashai replied, You are my Param Guru. Please do as you see fit. Babaji Mahashai said, Your residence is at Sri Shantipur, so we will address you as Sri Advaita Das. Lahiri Mahashai fell in prostrated obeisances and accepted the mercy of his new name. From that day on, everyone called him Sri Advaita Das, and they referred to the Kutia in which he resided and performed his bhajan as Advaita Kutia. Advaita Das had a childhood friend named Digambar Chattopadhyaya, who had earned vast wealth and reputation by performing important services in the Muslim royal administration. When Digambar Chattopadhyaya attained seniority, he retired from his government post and returned to his village of Ambika. There he heard that his childhood friend had renounced his home and was now living in Godrum under the name Sri Advaita Das and was spending his time chanting Harinam. Digambar Chattopadhyaya was a dogmatic worshipper of the goddess Durga and he would block his ears with his hands if he so much as heard the name of a Vaishnava. When he heard about the downfall of his beloved friend, he said to his servant, Vamana Das, arrange for a boat immediately, and I will go straight to Godruma. The servant quickly hired a boat and reported back to his master. Digambar Chattopadhyaya was very astute. He was a scholar of the Tantra Shastras and was highly skilled in the ways of Muslim civilization. His knowledge of Farsi and Arabic forced even Muslim scholars and teachers to admit defeat at his hands, and he would leave any Brahmana scholar dumbfounded by his expertise in arguing the Tantra Shastra. He had acquired a significant reputation in Delhi, Lucknow and other cities, and in his spare time he had written a book called Tantra Sangraha, a compendium on the Tantra, in which he displayed his extensive learning through his commentaries on the shlokas. Digambar took his Tantra Sangraha with him and climbed into the boat in a fiery mood. Within six hours they arrived at Sri Godruma, where Digambar instructed an intelligent man to go to Sri Advaita Das, while he himself remained in the boat. Digambar's messenger found Sri Advaita Das sitting in his kutia, chanting Harinam, 
and he offered pranam to him. Who are you, and why have you come? inquired Advaita Das. The man replied, I have been sent by the venerable Digambar Chattopadhyaya. He asks whether Kalidas still remembers him, or whether he has forgotten him. She Advaita Das asked rather eagerly, Where is Digambar? He is my childhood friend. How could I possibly forget him? Has he now adopted Vaishnava Dharma? The man said, He is sitting in a boat at the riverside. I cannot say whether he is a Vaishnava or not. Advaita Das said, Why is he at the riverside? Why doesn't he come to my kutia? When the messenger heard these inviting words, he left to inform Digambar, who arrived at Advaita Kutia within an hour, accompanied by a few other gentlemen. Digambar had always been a generous man at heart, and now he became overwhelmed with joy when he saw his old friend. He embraced Shi Advaita Das and sang a song that he had composed himself. O Mother Kali, who in the three worlds can fathom your pastimes? Sometimes you take the shape of a man, sometimes that of a woman, and sometimes you appear in battle in a ferocious mood. As Lord Brahma, you create the universe. As Lord Shiva, you destroy it. And as Lord Vishnu, you pervade the universe and maintain all living entities. As Sri Krishna, you appear in Vrindavan and wander from forest to forest playing the flute. Then again you appear in Navadvip as Sri Gora and intoxicate everyone with the chanting of Sri Harinam. Advaita Das offered Digambar Chattopadhyaya a seat made of leaves, saying, Come in, my brother, come in. It has been such a long time since we last met. Digambar sat on the seat, expressing his affection with tears as he said, My brother Kalidas, where shall I go? Now you have become a renunciant, and you don't care for the devas or for your religious duties. I came from Punjab, filled with so much hope, but our boyhood friends have all gone. Pesha, Pagala, Kenda, Girish, Ishi, Danuva, Kali, the carpenter, and Kanti Bhattacharya have all passed away. Now only you and I remain. I thought I could sometimes cross the Ganga and meet you at Shantipur, and you could sometimes cross the Ganga and visit me in Ambika. We could have spent whatever time remains to us singing together and studying the Tantra Shastra. Alas, fate has dealt me a cruel blow. You have become a worthless heap of cow dung, of no use in this life or the next. Tell me, how has this happened to you? Advaita Das could see that his boyhood friend was most undesirable company, and he began to devise a way of escaping from his clutches. Thinking like this, he said, Brother Digambar, do you remember that day in Ambika when we were playing Guli Danda and we reached the old tamarind tree? Digambar, yes, yes, I remember very clearly. It was the tamarind tree just next to Gauri Das Pandit's house. Gornitai used to sit underneath that tree. Adwaita, brother, as we were playing, you said, don't touch this tamarind tree. Aunt Sachi's son used to sit here, and if we touch this tree... We shall become renunciants. Digambar. Yes, I remember it well. I noticed that you had some leaning towards the Vaishnavas, and I said, You will fall into Goranga's trap. Adwaita. Brother, that has been my nature. At that time I was only on the verge of falling into that trap, but now I have actually fallen in. Digambar. Take my hand and come out. It is not good to remain in a trap. Advaita, Brother, I am very happy in this trap. I pray to remain here forever. Just touch this trap once and see for yourself. Digamba, I have seen everything. It seems like happiness in the beginning, but in the end you will see that it is just deception. Advaita, and what about the trap that you are in? Do you expect to obtain great happiness in the end? Don't delude yourself. Digamba, Look, we are the attendants of the goddess Mahavidya, Durga. We enjoy happiness now, and we will also enjoy it in the hereafter. You think that you are happy now, but I don't see that you are happy at all. Furthermore, there will be no limit to your suffering in the end. I cannot understand why anyone becomes a Vaishnava. You see, 
We enjoy eating meat and fish. We are well dressed, and we are more civilized than you Vaishnavas. We enjoy all the happiness that material science affords, whereas you are deprived of all these things, and ultimately you will not even gain deliverance. Advaita, brother, why do you claim that there will be no deliverance for me in the end? Digamba, no one, even Lord Brahma, Lord Vishnu, or Lord Shiva, can ever obtain salvation if they are indifferent to Mother Nishtarini. Mother Nishtarini, she who grants deliverance, is the primordial power. She manifests Brahma, Vishnu, and Mahesh, and after that she maintains them by her active potency. When that mother desires, everything re-enters her womb, which is the vessel that contains the entire universe. Have you ever worshipped the mother to invoke her mercy? Advaita, is Mother Nistarini a conscious entity or inert matter? Digamba, she is consciousness personified and she possesses independent will. It is by her desire alone that spirit is created. Advaita, what is Purush, spirit, and what is Prakriti, matter? Digamba, Vaishnavas engage only in bhajan. They have no knowledge of fundamental philosophical truths. Although Purush and Prakriti manifest as two phenomena, they are actually one, like the two halves of a chickpea. If you take the outer skin off the chickpea, there are two halves, but if the outer skin remains, there is one chickpea. Purush is conscious, and Prakriti is inert. When the conscious and inert merge into the one undifferentiated substance, it is known as Brahman. Advaita, is your mother Prakriti female or Purush male? Digamba, sometimes she is female and sometimes male. Advaita, so if Purush and Prakriti are like the two halves of a chickpea covered by a skin, which is the mother and which is the father? Digamba, are you making philosophical inquiries? Excellent. We are well acquainted with the truth. The fact is that the mother is Prakriti and the father is consciousness, Chaitanya. Advaita, and who are you? Digamba, Pasha Bado Bhavej Jiva, Pashu Mukta Sadashiva. When one is bound by the ropes of Maya, one is a Jiva, and when one is released from those bonds, one is Lord Sadashiva. Advaita, so are you spirit or matter? Digamba, I am spirit, and mother is matter. When I am bound, she is mother. When I become liberated, she will be my wife. Advaita, oh, splendid! Now the whole truth is exposed without any doubt. The person who is your mother now will become your wife later. Where did you get such a philosophy? Digamba Brother, I am not like you, simply wandering here and there saying Vaishnava, Vaishnava. I have acquired this knowledge by associating with innumerable perfected and liberated sannyasis, brahmacharis and tantrikas, and by studying the tantra shastra day and night. If you wish, I can also make you fit for understanding this knowledge. Advaita Das thought to himself, What a ghastly misfortune! But aloud he said, Very well, please explain one idea to me. What is civilization and what is material science? Prakritika Vigyan. Digamba. Civilization means to speak courteously in a cultured society, to dress oneself in a respectable and pleasing manner, and to eat and to conduct oneself in a way that is not repugnant to others. You do none of these things. Advaita, why do you say that? Digamba, you are distinctly unsociable, for you do not mingle with others. The Vaishnavas have never learned what it means to please others with sweet words. As soon as they lay eyes on anyone, they command him to chant Hari Nam. Why? Is there no other civilized discussion? Anyone who sees your dress will not be inclined to let you sit in an assembly. You wear a loincloth, a peculiar tuft of hair on the top of your head, and a garland of beads around your neck. What kind of an outfit is this? And you eat only potatoes and roots. You are not at all civilized. 
at Veta, deciding to start a quarrel so that Digambar would become angry and go away, which would be a great relief. Does your type of civilized living give you the opportunity to attain a higher destination in the next life? Digambar, culture does not in itself grant one a higher destination in the next life, but how can society be elevated without culture? If society is elevated, then one can endeavor for progress in other planets. Adwaita, brother, I may say something if you will not become dissatisfied. Digambar, you are my childhood friend. I would give up my life for you. How can I not tolerate whatever you have to say? I am a champion of civilized behavior. Even if I become angry, my words remain sweet. The more a man can conceal his inner feelings, the more cultured he is considered to be. Advaita, human life is very short, and there are many disturbances. In this brief span of life, the only duty of humanity is to worship Sri Hari with simplicity. Studying the ways of material civilization and culture is simply deceiving the soul. I have understood that the word civilization is simply another word for civil deception. A human being remains simple as long as he adheres to the path of truth. When he adopts the path of dishonesty, he desires to appear civilized and to please others by sweet words, but internally he remains addicted to deception and wicked deeds. What you describe as civilization has no good qualities, because truthfulness and simplicity are really the only good qualities. In modern times, civilization has come to mean keeping one's depravity concealed within. The word civilization, sabyata, literally means fitness to participate in a sabha, virtuous assembly. In reality, civilization that is free from sin and deception is only found amongst Vaishnavas. Non-Vaishnavas very much appreciate civilization that is saturated with sin. The civilization that you speak of is not related to the Nitya Dharma of the Jiva. If civilization means to adorn oneself in stylish clothes to appeal to others, then prostitutes are more civilized than you are. The only requirement for clothing is that you should cover the body and be clean and free from unpleasant odor. Food is faultless when it is pure and nutritious, but you only care whether it tastes good. You don't even consider whether it is pure or not. Wine and meat are naturally impure, and a civilization based upon the consumption of such things is simply a society dedicated to sin. What passes a civilization at present is the culture of Kali Yuga. Digamba. Have you forgotten the civilization of the Muslim emperors? Just consider the manners with which people sit in the court of the Muslim emperor. How politely they speak, and with such proper etiquette. Advaita. That is only worldly conduct. How deficient is a man really, if he does not abide by these external formalities? Brother, you have served in the Muslim government for so long that you have become partial to that type of civilization. In reality, human life only becomes civilized when it is sinless. The so-called advancement of civilization in Kali Yuga simply means an increase in sinful activity. This is nothing but hypocrisy. Digamba, Look, educated modern men have concluded that civilization means humanism and that those who are not civilized are not human beings. The primary sign of modern civilization is dressing women in very sophisticated clothes and ornaments to conceal their faults. Advaita, just consider whether this idea is good or bad. I perceive that those whom you call educated are merely rogues who have taken advantage of the times. Such people favor this deceitful civilization partly because of sinful impressions within their hearts and partly because they see it as an opportunity to conceal their faults. Can a wise man find happiness in such a civilization? Only vain arguments and physical intimidation can maintain veneration for a civilization of rogues. Digamba, Some people say that society is advancing with the increase of knowledge in the world, 
and eventually it will be like heaven on earth. Adwaita, that is simply fantasy. It is quite extraordinary that people have faith in this, and it is even more bizarre that others have the audacity to propagate such a view without actually believing it themselves. There are two types of knowledge. Paramatic knowledge relates to eternal truth, while lokic knowledge relates to this transitory world. Paramatic knowledge does not seem to be increasing. On the contrary, in most cases, knowledge has been corrupted and deviated from its original nature. Only lokic knowledge seems to be on the increase. Does the jiva have an eternal relationship with lokic knowledge? When lokic jnana increases, people's minds become distracted by temporary material pursuits and they neglect the original spiritual truth. I firmly believe that the more lokic jnana increases, the more duplicious a civilization becomes. This is a great misfortune for the living beings. Digamba A misfortune? Why? Adwaita as I said before, human life is very short. The jivas are like travelers at an inn, and they should use this brief span of life to prepare themselves for their ultimate destination. It would be sheer foolishness if travelers staying in an inn were so caught up with improving the conditions of their stay that they forgot their destination. The more one's involvement with material knowledge increases, the more one's time for spiritual matters dwindles. I am convinced that material knowledge should be used only as much as it is needed to maintain one's livelihood. There is no necessity for excessive material knowledge and its companion material civilization. For how many days will this earthly glitter remain? Digambar, I see that I have fallen into the clutches of an unyielding renunciant. Then does society serve no function? Advaita. That depends upon the composition of a particular society. The function served by a society of Vaishnavas is highly beneficial for the jivas, but a society of non-Vaishnavas or a society that is merely secular serves no useful function. But enough of this topic. Tell me, what do you mean by material science? Digamba, The Tantra Shastra has delineated many types of material science, Prakrita Vigyan. Material science includes whatever knowledge, skill and beauty are to be found in the material world, as well as all the various branches of knowledge, such as military science, medical science, music, dance and astronomy. Prakriti, material nature, is the primordial power, and by her own potency she has manifested this material universe and all the variety in it. Each and every form is a byproduct of this potency and is accompanied by the knowledge or science corresponding to it. When one acquires that knowledge, he is liberated from sins committed to Mother Nishtarini. The Vaishnavas do not seek this knowledge, but we Shaktas will obtain liberation on the strength of it. Just consider how many books have been written in pursuance of this knowledge by great men such as Plato, Aristotle, Socrates and the famous Hakim. Advaita, my brother Digamba, you have said that the Vaishnavas have no interest in Vigyan, experiential, realized knowledge. But that is not true. The pure knowledge of the Vaishnavas is endowed with Vigyan. Jnanam paramaguyam me yad vigyana samanvitam sarahasyam tarangam Chagrihana Gaditam Maya Srimad Bhagavatam 2.9.31 Sri Bhagavan said, O Brahma, knowledge of me is non-dual, and yet it has four distinct divisions, Gyan, Vigyan, Rahasya and Tadanga. A jiva cannot understand this by his own intelligence, but you can understand it by my mercy. Gyan is my Swarup and my relationship with my potency is Vigyan. The Jiva is my Rahasya, secret, and Pradhan is my Gyan Anga. Before this creation, Bhagavan was pleased with Brahma's worship and instructed him on the tenets of pure Vaishnava Dharma. Bhagavan said, O Brahma, I am explaining to you this most confidential knowledge of myself, 
which is endowed with realization, which contains the mystery of Prem, and which is composed of the Angas of sudden Bhakti. Accept all of this from me. My brother Digamba, there are two types of knowledge, Shuddha Gyan, pure knowledge, and Vishaya Gyan, knowledge of material objects. All human beings acquire Vishaya Gyan through the senses, but that knowledge is impure so it is useless for discerning transcendental objects. It is only useful in relation to the jiva's conditioned state of material existence. Knowledge that pertains to spiritual consciousness is known as Shuddha Gyan. That is eternal, and it is the basis of the Vaishnava's worship. Spiritual knowledge is the antithesis of material knowledge, and is completely distinct from it. You say that Vishaya Gyan is Vigyan, but it is not Vigyan in the true sense of the term. The real reason that your Ayurveda and other types of material knowledge are called Vigyan is that they are distinct from pure spiritual knowledge. True Vigyan is that pure knowledge that is distinct from material knowledge. There is no difference between Gyan, which is the knowledge of a truly abiding substance, Chidvastu, and Vigyan, which is the knowledge of how such an object is distinct from matter. Gyan is direct perception of a transcendental object, whereas Vigyan is the establishment of pure knowledge in contrast to material knowledge. Although these two are actually the same thing, they are known either as Gyan or as Vigyan according to the methods they employ. You say that Vigyan is material knowledge, but Vaishnavas say that Vigyan is the true diagnosis of material knowledge. They have examined the nature of military science, medical science, astronomy and chemistry, and they have concluded that these are all material knowledge, and that the jiva has no eternal connection with them. Therefore, these different types of material knowledge are of no consequence in relation to the jiva's nitya dharma. The Vaishnavas understand that those who are expanding their mundane knowledge according to their material propensities, are immersed in karma kanda. However, Vaishnavas do not condemn such materialists. Indirectly, the endeavors for material improvement help the Vaishnavas' spiritual progress to some extent. The material knowledge of those who pursue material advancement is insignificant, and you may call it prakritika vigyan, natural science. There is certainly no objection to that. It is foolish to quarrel over names. Digamba Well, if there were no advancement of material knowledge, how could you Vaishnavas conveniently satisfy your material needs and be free to engage in bhajan? You should also make some endeavor for material advancement. Advaita People work in different ways according to their respective inclinations. But Ishwara is the supreme controller of all, and he awards each person the appropriate result of his action. Digamba, where does inclination come from? Adwaita, inclination develops from deep-rooted impressions in the heart, acquired through previous activities. The more extensively one is involved with matter, the more expert he will be in material knowledge and the crafts originating from such knowledge. The articles that such people manufacture may help the Vaishnavas to serve Krishna, but there is no need for the Vaishnavas to labor for them separately. For example, carpenters earn their livelihood by producing shingasans, which Grihasta Vaishnavas use as platforms where they place the deity. Bees are inclined to gather honey, which devotees accept for the service of the deity. It is not that all the jivas of the world endeavor for spiritual advancement. They are engaged in different types of work, impelled by their respective natures. Human beings have different types of tendencies, some high and some low. Those with lower natures are impelled to engage in menial labor, which assists other types of work prompted by those of a higher nature. This division of work turns the wheel of the universe very beautifully. Everyone who is under the jurisdiction of matter works according to his material propensity, and thereby assists the Vaishnavas in their spiritual development. Such materialists are not aware that their activities are helping the Vaishnavas, 
because they are bewildered by the potency of Sri Vishnu's Maya. Consequently, the entire world serves the Vaishnavas, but unknowingly. Digamba, what is this Vishnu Maya? Advaita, in the Chandi Mahatmya Markandeya Purana, 8140, Vishnu Maya is described, Yoga Maya Hare Shakti Yaya Samohitam Jagat. The potency of Sri Hari, by which the entire world is bewildered, is known as Yoga Maya. Digamba, then who is the goddess I know as Mother Nishtarini? Advaita, she is Sri Hari's external potency, known as Vishnu Maya. Digamba then produced his book on Tantra. Digamba, look, it states in Tantra Shastra that my Divine Mother is consciousness personified. She possesses full will, and she is beyond the three qualities of material nature, yet she is the support of the three qualities. Your Vishnu Maya is not free from the influence of the modes of nature, so how can you equate your Vishnu Maya with my mother? It really irritates me that Vaishnavas are so fanatical. You Vaishnavas have blind faith. Advaita, my brother Digamba, please don't be angry. You have come to see me after such a long time, and I want to satisfy you. Is it a slight to speak of Vishnu Maya? Bhagavan Vishnu is the embodiment of supreme consciousness, and he is the one supreme controller of all. Everything that exists is his potency. Potency is not an independent object, but rather the functional power inherent within an object. To say that Shakti, potency, is the root of everything is thoroughly opposed to metaphysical truth. Shakti cannot exist independent of the object from which it originates. We must first accept the existence of an object that possesses full spiritual consciousness, otherwise accepting Shakti by itself is like dreaming of a flower in the sky. The commentary on Vedanta states, Shakti Shakti Matayo Abeda. There is no difference between the potency and the possessor of potency. This means that Shakti is not a separate object. The Supreme Person, who is the master of all potencies, is the one truly abiding substance. Shakti is the quality or inherent function that is subordinate to His will. You have said that Shakti is the embodiment of consciousness, that it possesses will, and that is beyond the influence of the three qualities of material nature. This is correct, but only in so far as Shakti operates fully under the support of a pure conscious entity, and is thus considered identical with that powerful entity. Desire and consciousness depend on the Supreme Being. Desire cannot exist in Shakti. Rather, Shakti acts in accordance with the desire of the Supreme Being. You have the power to move, and when you desire to move, that power will act. To say the power is moving is merely a figure of speech. It actually means that the person who possesses that power is moving. Bhagavan has only one Shakti, which is manifest in different forms. When it functions in a spiritual capacity, it is known as Chit Shakti, and when it operates in a material capacity, it is known as Maya or Jaj Shakti. It is stated in the Shvetashutara Upanishad 6.8 Parasya Shaktiya Vividaiva Shruyate The Vedas say that Sri Hari's divine Shakti is full of variety. The Shakti that supports the three modes of material nature, Sattva, Raja and Tama, is known as Jaj Shakti, and its functions are to create and destroy the universe. The Puranas and the Tantra refer to it as Vishnu Maya, Maha Maya, Maya and so on. There are many allegorical descriptions of her activities. For example, it is said that she is the mother of Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, and that she slew the demoniac brothers Shambhu and Nishambhu. The living entity remains under the control of this Shakti as long as he is engrossed in material enjoyment. When the jiva is endowed with pure knowledge, he becomes aware of his own Swarup, and this awareness enables him to transcend Maya Shakti and attain the liberated status. He then comes under the control of Chit Shakti and obtains spiritual happiness. Digambar 
Are you not under the control of some power? Adwaita, yes, we are Jiva Shakti. We have abandoned Maya Shakti and come under the protection of Chit Shakti. Digamba, then you are also a Shakta. Advaita, yes, the Vaishnavas are true Shaktas. We are under the control of Sri Radhika, who is the embodiment of Chit Shakti. It is only under her shelter that we render service to Krishna. So who is more of a Shakta than the Vaishnavas? We do not see any difference between the Vaishnavas and the real Shaktas. Those who are only attached to Maya Shakti, without taking shelter of Chit Shakti, may be called Shaktas, but they are not Vaishnavas, they are only materialists. In the Narada Pancharatra, Sri Durgadevi explains, Tava Vakshasi Radhaham Rase Vrindavane Vane In the forest known as Vrindavan, I am your internal Shakti, Sri Radhika, who adorns your chest in the Rasa dance. From this statement of Durgadevi, it is clear that there is only one Shakti, not two. That Shakti is Radhika, when she manifests as the internal potency, and she is Durga, when she is manifested as the external potency. In the condition of freedom from contact with the material modes of nature, Vishnu Maya is the Chit Shakti. That same Vishnu Maya is the Jad Shakti, when it is endowed with the modes of nature. Digamba, you said that you are Jiva Shakti. What is that? Advaita, Bhagavan has said in the Bhagavad Gita, seven four to five. Bhumiya apo nalo vayu, kang mano buddhya evacha, ahankara iti yam me, bina prakritir astada. Hipariye yam itastvanyam, prakritim vidi me param, jiva bhutam mahabaho. Yaye dang daryate jagat. My external shakti, known as prakriti, is divided into eight distinct components earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and egoism. You should know, however, that this eightfold prakriti is my inferior potency. O mighty armed Arjuna, I have another shakti known as the jiva, which is superior to the material potency and which is utilizing the resources of this universe. My dear Digamba, do you know the glory of Bhagavad Gita? This Shastra is the essence of the instructions of all Shastras, and it resolves all conflicts between the various philosophical ideologies. It establishes that the category of entities known as Jiva Tattva is fundamentally different from the material world and is one of Ishwara's potencies. Learned authorities refer to this tattva as the tatasta shakti. This shakti is superior to the external potency and inferior to the internal potency. Therefore, the jivas are a unique shakti of Krishna. Digamba Kalidas, have you read the Devi Gita? Advaita Yes, I read it quite some time ago. Digamba What is the nature of its philosophical teachings? Advaita my brother Digamba, people praise molasses only as long as they have not tasted sugar candy. Digamba, my brother, this is simply blind faith on your part. Everyone has tremendous regard for the Devi Bhagavat and the Devi Gita. You Vaishnavas are the only people who cannot even bear to hear the names of these two books. Advaita, have you read the Devi Gita? Digamba, no. Why should I lie? I was going to copy these two books, but I still have not been able to do so. Advaita, how can you say whether a book is good or bad when you have not even read it? Is it my faith or yours that is blind? Digamba, brother, I have been somewhat afraid of you ever since childhood. You were always very talkative, but now that you have become a Vaishnava, you are even more assertive in expressing your views. Whatever I say, you cut to pieces. Advaita, I am certainly a worthless fool, but I can see that there is no Shuddha Dharma apart from Vaishnava Dharma. You were always inimical to the Vaishnavas, and that is why you could not even recognize the path of your own auspiciousness. Digamba, 
a little angry. Oh, you're so sure of your own position. Do you claim that I cannot see the path of my own auspiciousness, when I have performed so much sadden and bhajan? Have I been cutting grass all this time to feed my horse? Just look at this Tantra Sangraha that I have written. Do you think it was a joke to produce a book like this? You arrogantly flaunt your Vaishnavism and ridicule modern science and civilization. What am I to do about this? Come, let us go to a civilized assembly and see who will be judged right, you or me. At Waitadas wanted to be free from Digambar's undesirable association as soon as possible, for he felt that this meeting was completely non-productive. Well, brother, he said, what use will your material science and civilization be at the time of death? Digambar, Kalidas, you really are a strange fellow. Will anything remain after death? As long as you are alive, you should try to acquire fame among civilized men, and enjoy the five pleasures, wine, meat, fish, wealth, and women. At the time of death, Mother Nishtarini will arrange for you to go wherever you are meant to go. Death is certain, so why are you subjecting yourself to so much tribulation at present? Where will you be when the five elements of this body merge with the five great elements of material nature? This world is Maya, Yoga Maya, and Maha Maya. It is she who can award you happiness now and liberation after death. Nothing exists except Shakti. You have come from Shakti, and you will return to Shakti in the end. Just serve Shakti, and witness the power of Shakti in science. Try to increase your spiritual power through yoga discipline. In the end, you will see that there is nothing other than this imperceptible potency. Where did you get this far-fetched tale about a conscious supreme God? Your belief in such a story is making you suffer now, and I can't fathom what destination you will attain in the next life that will be superior to ours. What is the need for a personal God? Just serve Shakti, and when you merge into that Shakti, you will remain there eternally. Advaita, my brother, you have become infatuated with this material Shakti. If there is an all-knowing Bhagavan, then what will happen to you after death? What is happiness? Happiness is peace of mind. I have given up all material pleasure and found happiness in inner peace. If there is anything more to be achieved after death, I will attain that as well. You are not satisfied. The more you try to enjoy, the more your thirst for material pleasure expands. You do not even know what happiness is. You are simply drifting in the current of sensuality and calling out, Pleasure, pleasure! but one day you will fall into an ocean of sorrow. Digamba, whatever will be my fate will be, but why have you abandoned the association of cultured men? Advaita, I have not renounced the association of cultured men. Rather, that is precisely what I have obtained. I am trying to give up the association of degenerate men. Digamba, how do you define degenerate association? Advaita, Please hear without becoming angry, and I will tell you. Srimad Bhagavatam says, 4.30.33 Yavate mayayash prista, brahmama iha karma bi, tavat bhavat prasanganam, sangasya no bhave bhave. Quoted in Hari Bhakti Vilas, 10.2.92 O Bhagavan, we pray that as long as we are bewildered by your illusory potency, and are wandering in material existence under the influence of our karmic activities, we may have the association of your premi bhaktas, birth after birth. It is said in the Hari Bhakti Vilas, 10.2.94, Asadvi saha sangas tu, na kartavya kadachana, yasmat sarvata hani syad, adapatascha jayate. One should never associate with people who are immersed in non-reality for by such association one is deprived of all worthwhile objects of attainment and falls down to a degraded position. The Katyayana Samhita states, Varam huta vahajvala panjarantar vyavashtiti nashori chinta vimoka jana samvasa vaishasam Quoted in Hari Bhakti Vilas 10.2.95 
It would be better to live in a cage of fire than to suffer the misery of associating with those who are inimical to the thought of Sri Krishna. It is said in Srimad Bhagavatam 3.31.33-34 Satyam Solcham Daya Maunam Budhiya Khrir Shri Yeshakshama Samo Damo Bhagash Cheti Yat Sangad Yati Sankshayam Tve Shanante Shu Mude Shu Kandi Tatma Svasadu Shu Sangang Na Korach Chokche Shu Yoshit Krida Mrigeshu Cha if one associates with those who are devoid of virtue, one's good qualities, such as truthfulness, cleanliness, mercy, restraint of speech, intelligence, shyness, wealth, fame, forgiveness, control of the senses, control of the mind and fortune, completely fade away. Therefore one should never associate with disgraceful people who are agitated by desires for sense enjoyment, who are foolish, who are engrossed in the bodily conception of life and who are playthings in the hands of women. It is said in the Garuda Purana, Antargato pivedanang sarva shastra tavedyapi yona sarveshvare bhaktas tang vidyat purushadamam quoted in Hari Bhakti Vilas 10.303 One may have studied all the Vedas and be acquainted with the meaning of all the shastras but if he is not a devotee of Sri Hari, he should be understood as the lowest of men. Srimad Bhagavatam 6.1.18 states, Prayaschitani Chiranani Narayana Paranmukam Nanishpunati Rajendra Surakumbam Ivapaga Quoted in Hari Bhakti Vilas 10.305 O King, just as the water of many rivers cannot purify a wine pot. Similarly, a person who is averse to Sri Narayan cannot become purified by all the different types of atonement, even if they are executed perfectly again and again. It is also said in the Skanda Purana, Hanti nindati vaidveshti Vaishnavan nabinandati Krudyate yati no harsham Darshane patananishat quoted in Hari Bhakti Vilas 10.3.12. The six causes of downfall are to beat a Vaishnava, to slander him, to bear malice against him, to fail to welcome or please him, to display anger towards him, and to not feel pleasure upon seeing him. My brother Digamba, a person can never attain auspiciousness through these types of immoral association. What possible benefit can one gain by living in a society composed of such men? Digamba Well now, what a distinguished gentleman I have come to speak with. You should certainly stay amidst the pure Vaishnavas. I am going to my own house. Advaita Das felt that his exchange with Digamba was drawing to a close, and that it would be appropriate to conclude on a pleasant note. In a courteous mood he said, you are my childhood friend. I know you must return home, but I don't want you to go just yet. You have come all this way, so please stay for a while. Take some prasad, and then you may go. Digamba Kalidas, you know very well that I follow a strict diet. I only eat Havishya, and I had a meal just before coming here. However, it was a pleasure to see you. I will come again if I find the time. I cannot stay overnight because I have some duties to perform according to the system given to me by my guru. Brother, I must take my leave for today. Advaita, I shall see you off to the boat. Let us go. Digamba, no, no, carry on with your own business. I have some men with me. Digamba then went away singing a song about Goddess Kali and Advaita Das was able to chant Sri Nam in his kutia without further obstruction. Thus ends the ninth chapter of Jaiva Dharma entitled Nitya Dharma, Material Science and Civilization.